being one of the uh, co chairmen of uh, Symposium on Innovation Technology and Special Economy, uh, John, I really appreciate the word, words to both. And, uh, and say, to say the best about people with those. Thank you very much. Is the microphone loud enough for the back? So you can hear us and turn it up. So you can hear us and turn it up. It's on. Uh, well, but you can't hear me very well. Uh, no, 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 no. Speak up.
a mixed system, of, let's say an amorphous binder, and with a zeolite, if you want that metal to sit in the zeolite, that takes a lot of wonderful inorganic chemistry to develop to get the metal metal where you want. And the catalyst deactivates, there's a certain amount of sintering that goes on, and that metal can migrate in many various places and you have to get it back. So the regeneration of this catalyst system is really one of the most difficult and one of the most uh, uh, intriguing actually the, the science-based development of regeneration technology, which I'm not going to get involved in, in direct detail that day, but Dr. Fung is going to talk about later on the symposium. And we'll give you bits and pieces about uh, chemistry involved in catalyst regeneration. Just to put things a little bit in more perspective, over the, over the years, uh, the catalyst, the flat tail catalyst has been uh, to be much more selective and, uh, and uh, act benzene uh, producer. Uh, first reports on uh, health in the early 80s, uh, we're getting about 45% of the yield, even on somewhat non optimal channels, uh, we're getting about 70% yields and we're getting about greater than 70% selectivity in the conversion of uh, ozone hexane. And once again, we're much higher. And conventional life functional <coughs> catalysts. And also, people that are involved in this type of chemistry, these are extremely high conversions. We're talking 90% conversion, and still getting extremely high sensitivity for these molecules not being trapped in one gas. Okay, so let's Just to, to show you that the fact when you get to part of the active catalyst, you want to actually start seeing the clustering in the core model. It's about 12, 30 minutes in the particles. And of course, the amount of decoration and the amount of centering is highly dependent upon the extent of the activity. 
really the uh, basis of this, the rest of the talk is going to be centering on the, uh, the activation of these type of catalysts and uh, means to overcome in part some of those deactivation processes. Early on, it was recognized that the platinum KL catalyst is extremely sulfur sensitive. <laughs> This is just comparing uh, the conversion of actually a very dramatic feedstock. It's not just simply uh, hexane. It's only about it's 87 percent hexane and it's 11 percent metal cyclopentane. And smaller amounts of uh, three methyl or two methyl pentane that, that came with the hexane feed. But this MCP is added because it's much more of a deactivated feed. And so we really follow the activation catalyst. And we're just looking at uh, runs in which uh, the runs which are varying the amount of sulfur. And note that the sulfur is in parts per billion of that parts per billion. And uh, the mill sulfur is where um, no sulfur, I mean, these, these feeds were highly hydrofined and filled with reduced. And uh, conventionally, the best we could get, uh, we had data that we had fair copies in 10 parts per billion concentration of the sulfur. Uh, we found that it was uh, milk. That kind of scale. 50 up to 200 parts per billion, quite literally economized. But you can see that there's really a very large differences in the uh, deactivation rate as well as the slope the change in the density over time. And one increases the uh, sulfur. Another important thing to develop, and it's interesting from a catalytic point of view, is that these catalysts do not go to zero. So the sulfur is not completely deactivated as a whole. This catalyst kind of system it actually converges to about 10 to 8 percent of the benzene yield. Then the catalyst will stay stable at that extent indefinitely. And we think that is simply a consequence of the plant being on the exterior part of the plant zeolite or involved in the matrix. Another very uh, simple way to look at data is quite it gives quite a bit of information is to look at the very simple plot. These are the kind of plots that John Simple uh, um, is that if I send a look at the amount of benzene form versus the amount of benzene deal, and it doesn't really matter. The commonality all occurs whether I have sulfur added or no sulfur. It's different levels of conversion levels amount of yield, but it isn't changing. In my mind, that's saying that sulfur per se is not changing the catalyst, the catalyst, the catalyst. So it's looking at what it's doing. It's eliminating the platinum, exactly. It's really almost like a titration type of curve. Very informative curve, very simple. There's a lot of information in this cycle.
most abundant sizes in the range from about 1.7 to 2.4. the old school at 17 to 24 angstroms, which are very, very soon. They're actually quite small, and if those were the, the, the maximum size of the particles or the common size of the particles, one would have retained activity or the atomization much higher than they're seeing. So a relatively small amount of centrum is involved in the aggregate of large particles. So very hand-waving our uh, uh, way to think about that is that in a Fairly highly dispersed system, there is a possibility that one can have a small cluster <coughs> in the channel of zeolite, which actually there is a bulging in the KL of zeolite from about an entrance of about 7 and up to around 13 inches as it moves down the column. That within the wider uh, regions of the zeolite, there can be very substantial, relatively large particles in the form, which a number of the particles are not. Uh, uh, Exposed to the, to the reactant, but certainly nothing to the extent that uh, the talus is affected. We think, however, that there's probably a uh, double line of zeal, and actually there's a significant amount of the uh, metals can actually be quite well dispersed. The main on that is probably near the four, near the four mile in, in, in the parts of the talus that we're just blanking off. Another just a little back of the envelope calculation is that the average length of these uh, larger uh, crystallite uh, uh, KL crystals on the order of 1 to 1.2 microns. And this catalyst is loaded at 0.6 weight percent platinum. And that would uh, mean that in any channel that one has about 100 120 platinum atoms in the full square well, in the channel, they're all known in the channel. And since it takes them on the order of about uh, Six to seven or eight platinum atoms to completely close off that pore. Uh, one can just ratio 12 to 14 over 120, one gets to about 10 percent that is going to close off the whole channel. And that really is what I'm talking about. Is really introducing what uh, we thought might be important in this analysis is if uh, we are actually blinding. Much of the is the main reactant. If we could just systematically vary the length of this KL channel, we could very well perhaps decrease uh, significantly the light of the channel. And through the absolute magic of one of our colleagues, Hans Verdine, in our class in Belgium, an extremely fine uh, synthetic zeolite chemist, uh, he was able to do just that type of work. The, the, the large crystal light example, kind of what we call the standard element, is quite large in size. And you see that the basal plane is very rough, and they're almost a screw axis on the basal plane. And it has a uh, length and angle ratio of about one, you know, the length of the magnet and the compound. And he has been able to fabricate these in much smaller crystal lights, in which the uh, basal plane is very flat. And we think. Flat as the basal plane also uh, can uh, help greatly ingress or, or, or regress of the, uh, the reactants and the products. So we think you really also can kind of flat the plane. So this also is improving. And then finally, the very kind of interesting looking material that within the company where it always gives names to little things that we see. It's called this thing by the hot products. That's like uh, the Kikos where the diameter is uh, substantially larger than the length. And from a synthetic point of view, that's very important because uh, one gets down to one point one, point two micron range in size, it's very hard to filter these things. If you have one part of the crystal that is larger than the other, and uh, they become filterable and one can actually uh, it's an easier process. But now we synthesize these to in the hopes that these that these materials allow us to have a, a large, uh, more active and perhaps uh, more stable. Actually, the first initial assumption was that these catalysts would uh, be uh, more uh, stable. I'm comparing here now uh, standard large crystallite and with the smaller crystallite as well as the hydrocarbons. 
much more stable catalyst than in the larger form, than in the larger form. And uh, I'll contrast with that against the, uh, the platinum tin conventional reform catalyst. And the platinum tin is carefully chosen because it doesn't have that sulfur match uh, to, to activate it to retard any type of uh, non selective as well. Over time. So I want to compare this the best I could with the, uh, with the conventional reform it was about a factor of three to three and a half higher benzene yield over that of the standard platinum uh, tin gallons. And more importantly than that, uh, one is really more interested in modern catalysis and selectivity. And this is a very interesting selectivity. It's just it's a ratio of benzene to product we want to make versus the off gases that one can make by tracking that we don't want. Right? So a high ratio is very good. You see it with the small crystallites and the hot conductor is substantially superior to that of the standard catalyst, and the market is superior to that of the conventional reform catalyst. This is just a quick synopsis of those curves, of which uh, we're just showing that uh, upon lowering the uh, link to the diameter ratio from 1 to 1.3, Increase the light on the projected light on those gallons by a approach of the fire that's making the value. And of course, those lengths are really predicated on how long uh, and what prediction you want to have as a commission viable or production event. Our production is around 40 million percent. Okay, let's That type of advantage of uh, those were in, uh, those comparisons were on the non-fabricated uh, extrusion catalysts that were just uh, in the heat uh, zeolites themselves and commercial production of uh, small crystallites and standard large crystallites. So there's just a very market uh, change in the density of the top. It's very good. This pilot kind of shape is not a small and it's using a real feedstock uh, in these uh, commercially uh, violent conditions with very low pressure to the PSIG and higher energy center, space velocity around two, and relatively low hydrogen feed ratio. Another, another very important point that we found in the work of these KL cattle systems, what happens on generation is very typical. The fresh activity of the catalyst, and this is working with the C6, C, uh, C7, 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 same type of condition that now we're on 5 to 10 degrees, still low pressure in the particular GSIG. And the initial performance of the KL uh, uh, catalysts, small crystal catalysts, is uh, by the, the activation. When the catalyst is regenerated, First, actually, they much enhanced activity by doing a commercial type of regeneration on beginning as prepared material, fine dispersion. And then that's reflected in very, very high selectivity. And the initial, somewhat lower selectivity shown by the regenerated counts essentially reflects a very hot metal activity initially. So you have a much higher uh, dispersion. Very interesting, and I think uh, uh, commercially viable materials. And, uh, as far as I know, they're already in two or three, possibly four uh, units worldwide right now. The SKL zeolite materials, in which the zeolites have a few crystal defects, flat base of planes, we like to minimize in a very short channel, in the order of 1.16 kilometers, high volume dispersion, minimize the channel volume. Redispersion of fresh uh, or spent DDK analysis to market the food and alcohol and organization activity. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Uh, why don't you stay there? This paper is open for questions. Um, Alvin, I'm oh, sorry, that's Terry Baker. Terry. Uh, Gary, you, you say that one sulfur atom 
kills effectively 10 platinum. Oh, excuse me, Terry, would you identify, I, I should tell anybody who has a question, please identify your affiliation. Okay, uh, Northeastern University, Terry Baker. Thanks, um, Terry. One sulfur atom affects or kills 10 platinum. Uh, what's your rationale for this? Geometric, electronic, or is it reconstruction? I think it shows up here, Terry, is that uh, within the channel we're doing work. <coughs> it's hard to see but then can you, can you see these small particles in, in this channel? What we're doing, we're just sealing off those channels with a small, relatively small amount of light. But the sulfur accelerates that agglomeration. All you need to do is agglomerate only a small amount and seal off the whole channel. Yes, we have an affiliation and question. Uh, George Lester, uh, Northwestern. Uh, Gary, uh, I'm sure you know the answer to this, uh, but I don't. Another, alter another explanation for the benefit you're getting out of the short channels might be that uh, you're getting not actual physical blocking of the pores by the agglomeration, but that the sulfur is actually poisoning the pores at the entrance of the channels uh, first, forcing diffusivity, or forcing the reactants to diffuse through and it becomes a, a pore mouth poisoning rather than a, a blockage. Uh, got evidence to eliminate that? No, in fact, I think that's, uh, I guess I wasn't too clear. I think that's exactly the reason. I think that is part of the reason. I think salt actually magnifies that centering of platinum at the pore mouth, whether it's the platinum sulfide or the platinum itself that's sealing off those, or near the pore mouth. It doesn't have to go far in. But, but uh, perhaps, suppose that it doesn't actually seal the pores. Uh -huh. It just poisons the easily accessible uh, platinum and forces the reactant to have to go deeper into the pores to find unpoisoned uh, material. Uh, under math, you know, if, if you're if you're in pore diffusion uh, regime, if you're that active, then that could also, I think, give the results that you've shown. But you obviously have re yes. results that. Let me, let me, uh, let me have the next question was, uh, I promised uh, Professor Michelle Goudard from Stanford. Uh, Gary, I admire your ability to control size and uh, uh, morphology of the zeolites. They are being reported a bit of literature on that. Can you comment on this? Tell me what? The morphology and size of the zeolites. How are they made? Well, can you comment on how this control can be put into effect? I really have not been released to talk about that. So, it's in, it's in, it's in, it's in, <laughs> Gary, that's what I used to say when I didn't know the answer to it. <laughs> only kidding, Gary. Only kidding. Uh, listen, um, I think we need to move on. Unless there's one burning question, a real quick one. Uh, we, okay, one, one last one. Uh, Chang, Mobile. Uh, Gary, uh, can you explain why the activity levels are? I think it's because the metal is on the exterior part of the zeolite, and we know that those type of sulfur concentrations, if, if you're on an amorphous binder, I believe there's a fraction, a small fraction of the metal that's there that gives you constant activity. It has nothing to do with the activity of the zeolite. Because I was, I try to be careful when I'm saying that, because you see that bead line deactivation, why doesn't it go to zero? I think it's because it's on the amorphous binder. Thank you, uh, Gary McVicker. That was a, a very nice presentation. We appreciate uh, your effort. I'd like to introduce the uh, next uh, presentation. The title of the talk is Recent Applications of Pressure Tuning Spectroscopy, and it is 